focus on age discrimination in Australia. Age discrimination is widespread in our community. Like other forms of illegal discrimination, it damages individuals and our society and it violates human rights. My comments are based on the premise that we all have human rights. These are the rights protected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 and strengthened and expanded by the range of international rights conventions built on that foundation of the Declaration. We all have these rights from the beginning of our lives and on through to the end of our lives. Those rights do not diminish with age. It is up to us to ensure that laws, policies, practices and community attitudes that currently diminish the rights of older people are addressed and changed so that it can become true to say, in fact, that human rights never age. So what's the age discrimination uh, picture in Australia right now? At the Australian Human Rights Commission, we receive and deal with individual complaints that fall within the scope of the four and discrimination laws we administer and the international rights conventions included in the Australian Human Rights Commission Act of 1986. Most age discrimination complaints that we receive at the Commission are in the area of employment. During 210, 211 years, we received 175 complaints related to age and approximately 70% of these related to employment. Now, this single statistic alone demonstrates the significance of age discrimination in employment. Put together with a range of other indicators from ABS statistics and specific research, it suggests that age discrimination in employment is the worst and most harmful manifestation of this form of illegal discrimination. And that is why employment is my priority as age discrimination commissioner. <coughs> age discrimination in the workforce acts in two ways. It undermines older workers currently in jobs by excluding them from training and promotion and by creating a hostile atmosphere that destroys their confidence and thus makes them vulnerable to redundancies. The second major effect is on older unemployed people trying to get back into the workforce. Recruitment practices are stacked against unemployed people from 45 up. Despite the existence of the Age Discrimination Act 2004, a directly discriminatory preference for young recruits is often stated. Even more often, code words like energetic, dynamic, innovative, are used to shut the door in the face of older workers, people with uh, extensive relevant skills and experience and a proven track record. ABS statistics show unemployed Australians aged over 45 reported that the main difficulty in finding work, accounting for 18% of cases, was that they were considered too old by employers. A recent study by the Financial Services Council reported 35% of workers aged 50 and older earning between $40,000 and $80,000 a year, saying that they felt discriminated against because of their age. The most common form of discrimination according to this FSC study was being made redundant or laid off before others. This view was backed up by responses from employers who noted in the report that this age discrimination was by far the most common form of discrimination. Older workers also highlighted a lack of training opportunities, verbal abuse, and inflexibility towards health and physical needs. So I think the extent of this discrimination needs to be acknowledged more widely. Not only does long-term, often permanent unemployment for older people, create massive financial and personal problems for affected individuals. This wasting of a large cohort of otherwise positive contributors to our economy builds up a massive cost for the public purse. National Seniors Research found nearly 2 million, 2 million older Australians who are willing to work, could be encouraged to work, or are unemployed and looking for work and have no work. That's 2 million people who could be participating who are not. National seniors also found that more than 200,000 people over 55 would take up jobs tomorrow if they were able. Now the cost of this wastage 
has been uh, estimated as $10.8 billion a year to the national economy. Now, it not only costs the public purse in terms of um, tax revenues foregone, public benefits payout, and so on, it weakens the economy, it weakens the national economy by holding back growth. Business growth does require what these people have to offer. A recent report by Deloitte Access Economics entitled Where is Your Next Worker? argues that the problem in Australia in coming years won't be a lack of jobs, it will be a lack of workers. Deloitte reports that the population aged between 55 and 70 is a massive untapped source of productive capacity. And they go on in that study to, to predict that businesses, organisations that don't start utilising that massive pool of untapped talent will fail sooner or later. Well, what are the protections against age discrimination? In Australia, there are a number of institutions that can receive age discrimination complaints. There are equal opportunity commissions in each state and territory and two federal bodies, the Fair Work Commission and the Australian Human Rights Commission. People have a choice as to where they take their complaint. The Australian Human Rights Commission has obligations to administer the Age Discrimination Act 2004 with protections in the areas of employment, education, access to premises, provision of goods and services, disposal of land, Commonwealth laws and programs, and requests for information. And the primary purposes of the Act are to raise awareness that people of all ages have the same fundamental rights to equality before the law, eliminate unlawful age discrimination within our community, and respond to demographic change by removing barriers to older people participating in society and to change negative stereotypes about older people. In 2011, this Act was amended to include a dedicated age discrimination commissioner, and I took up that position. <coughs> So how do we, the Human Rights Commission, uh, define age discrimination in <coughs> human rights terms? As you'll be aware, the Australian Government also has human rights obligations in relation to age. While we don't have an age-specific convention under the UN system, although there are discussions proceeding to that end, if anyone's interested in talking about the question time, but we don't have it yet, but certain age obligations are contained in other conventions, and they require governments to ensure that older people are protected from poverty through the provision of social security income and ensure that there are employment, career guidance and training options for older workers. Now, while it's fair to say that governments in Australia over recent years, particularly since the passage of the Age Discrimination Act 2004, have acknowledged the need to remove age discrimination and have introduced a range of policies and programs to uh, improve fairness and equity, other policies, other public policies that remain in place actually work against these objectives. Now let's look at the decision to increase the qualifying age for the age pension. With this decision, the Australian Government has created an incentive, or perhaps more accurately, an imperative for Australians to remain in the workforce to age 67. The measure is due to be in full effect in 2023. The change was broadly supported, but it did not lead to a systematic review of other policies that bar people working over 65, which of course they will now need to do before they qualify for the age pension. So there is at least a two years gap. The situation is worse, but there is that obvious two years gap coming upon us as to um, when we can get the pension. Now, currently around 80% of retired people rely on the age pension to some degree. That's 80%, 80%. So we're not looking at a small number of, of people here. We are looking at a necessary and very large increase of people aged between 65 and 67 in the labour market at the time when the evidence shows that over 65 seeking work come up against a range of barriers. The removal of these barriers falls to a large extent, although not entirely, to government and public policy. Despite a range of positive measures, there remain significant gaps in the way public policy supports older workers wishing to continue work. Some of the factors that might be pushing people out of work prematurely are limits on workers' compensation, 
income insurance, superannuation and some driver's licence requirements. I've recently launched a paper called Working Past Our 60s, Reforming Laws and Policies for the Older Worker. And this paper looks in detail at barriers to workforce participation after the mid-60s, specifically government and industry age limits or age caps that reduce or withdraw the entitlements of older workers. Now let's look at workers' compensation. In most jurisdictions, and of course you'll be aware that each state, each territory has its own scheme and the Commonwealth has three schemes. So, in most of these jurisdictions, not all, I'm happy to say, the age at which the income replacement part of workers' comp is cut off or limited is 65 years. If injured at work, older workers are covered for medical expenses, but not the income replacement aspect. So what are they supposed to do? Why the age cut cutoff? Now, is it more costly for insurance for the older worker? Well, we're not, uh, we cannot see any data to justify the workers' compensation age limits. We cannot find data indicating that older people are more prone to workplace accidents. In fact, some of the evidence uh, suggests the contrary. The ABS Work-Related <coughs> Injuries Report found that people aged 65 years and over recorded the lowest rate of work-related injuries, um, uh, injuries and illnesses, with um, 30 per thousand people uh, suffering those. The highest rate of work-related injury or illness were in the 45 to 49 year age group at 72 per thousand people. So on the basis of this sort of evidence, it is hard to see the rationale to keep the age bar for workers' compensation at 65. Now, Queensland and Western Australia don't have an age limit on workers' comp. Western Australia lifted theirs last year. Instead, they have cap limits on the period or the amount that the scheme will be paid. Now, if two states can lift these age bars, why can't the others? And then there's the question of income protection insurance. There's no joy for older workers who want to protect themselves through income protection insurance. Along with workers' comp, income insurance cuts out in the early to mid 60s, with some exceptions where the coverage is provided as 70. But that's only 70 some, and after 70, none. Some of you might have seen a current affair the other day, I don't know whether your viewers the current affair, where we had the case of a, a, a skilled tradesman building worker, 70, who could not continue working because he couldn't get insurance. Um, he was quite an impressive character, if anyone saw him, a, a, a picture of perfect physical fitness, very happy to take off his shirt, show his muscles, show his running, but very, very loose with about the point that he's there, he's willing to work, we hear about trade skills, work just constantly, and he can't go on site because he can't get insurance. So that's, uh, that, that, it was a very stark and in that way very good illustration of what we're dealing with. And uh, the trades, people who have their own business are also affected, even uh, worse, if they want to run your own public business, uh, electrician business. Um, most in business insurance for those sorts of businesses cuts out at 60, a couple of exceptions, but basically 60. Now, under the Age Discrimination Act, it is possible to deny income insurance on the basis of actuarial or statistical data on which it is reasonable for the discriminator to rely. That has not been tested in the courts, but um, rather than waiting for a test that may or may not come about actuarial data, um, I'm, I'm trying to get reform in any case through discussion and advocacy. Then there's licensing requirements for professional drivers. A further problem for older workers can be the restrictions and obligations that are imposed on older drivers. This can be for drivers of private vehicles and for drivers of commercial vehicles. Most state and territory motor registration authorities mandate medical tests and competency tests for older drivers. These tests, again, we are in Australia, vary widely from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, in itself a huge problem. From representations I receive, and I receive many on this point, it appears that some of these sets of rules do have the effect of disqual disqualifying capable drivers, thus rendering them unable to earn a living. Now, while I have 
states very clearly, I accept and promote the prime importance of safety on the road for the driver and for the other people on the road equally. I do propose that we revisit arbitrary and inconsistent testing for people once they reach a particular age. What I am advocating is a nationally consistent approach to driving licence requirements where the key is capacity rather than age. In the human rights context, it is important to keep willing older people in work. The right to work is fundamental, and while we are willing and able to work, that right should not be affected by age alone. Failure to protect that right for older people exposes them to other rights violations, including loss of adequate income, health problems, and loss of secure housing. As well as our individual rights, it is clear that the health of our national economy and its capacity to provide for the basic rights of all of us depends on making more productive use of older people. You may have heard this statistic before, I'm sure you have, but it's worth repeating. We currently have five workers for every person over the age of 65. That is, workers who pay tax to provide revenue for the age, pension, health and education systems, etc. However, without radical change, the number of workers for each person over 65 is predicted to decline to 2.7 workers by 2050. If this situation does eventuate, it will have serious negative implications for tax revenue and therefore for a cohesive fair society. So to protect our civil society, as well as to protect the rights of older people, we need a significant extension for the length of the average working life. So who's addressing the problem? Well, some important activities are underway. A project of Safe Work Australia will encourage the states and territories to harmonise aspects of workers' compensation legislation, and the age factor is being fed in there. There is continuing support, including from the federal government, for the work of the Insurance Reform Advisory Group to examine insurance issues with industry and stakeholders. In terms of law reform, two major current initiatives have the potential to lead to stronger protections for the rights of older people. First, there's the Australian Law Reform Commission review of Commonwealth legislation that prevents people over 45 from staying in the workforce. Now, this review should establish the case for extensive policy and law reform. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's the Attorney General's project to consolidate the five and discrimination acts into a single law. I'm sure most of you would be aware of that. This initiative holds great potential for improvements in all aspects all aspects of anti discrimination law and human rights protection, including the rights of older people. The Australian Law Reform Commission's inquiry into Commonwealth laws that discriminate on the basis of age, called the Age Barriers Inquiry, is underway, and I've been appointed as a part-time commissioner to this inquiry. The inquiry has been asked to look at superannuation law, family assistance, child support, social security law, employment law, insurance law, compensation laws, and any other relevant Commonwealth legislation exempt under the Age Discrimination Act 2004. And the true age is defined as being over 45 years. Uh, now, that, that inquiry has uh, released an issues paper and uh, We've received over 50 submissions and completed 56 consultations throughout Australia. The second, a second discussion paper will be released in mid-September. Submissions to this due in November. Then there will be another wide consultation, then a report with law reform recommendations April next year. <coughs> now the consolidation exercise, the consolidation of the Part and Discrimination Acts, as you know, the Australian Government is currently looking to consolidate the five federal anti-discrimination laws into a single law that also extends protections to people on the grounds of sexual orientation and sexual identity. We call this the Harmonisation or Consolidation Projects. Project. The Attorney General's Department is developing an exposure draft of the legislation, which I believe we will see quite soon. In the Human Rights Commission submission to the Con Consolidation of Laws Inquiry, we recommended first that there should be no reduction in the level of protection currently provided by the existing five laws. We also recommended that the beneficial and best practice features of existing <coughs> anti-discrimination legislation should not only be maintained, but as far as possible, applied to other grounds of discrimination. 
In other words, the gold standard of discrimination protections should be applied to the new consolidated law in all its aspects. We argue for consistency between Commonwealth discrimination law and the non-discrimination provisions of the Fair Work Act, not yet achieved, and between Commonwealth uh, discrimination law and areas of best practice in the state and territory and discrimination and equal opportunity laws. We also argued for a reduction in the number of exemptions in the Act and for the exemptions to be more narrowly defined. A simplified and consolidated anti-discrimination law, which specifies protected attributes, is likely to clarify our understanding of discrimination across the community and potentially simplify the system for respondents and complainants. One of the reasons why it will simplify discrimination protections is because much discrimination is intersectional. In other words, the discrimination may include a combination of sex, age, race or disability discrimination. The current different discrimination laws make it difficult for complaints to know how best <coughs> complainants to, to know how best to find redress. Is it age discrimination, gender discrimination, disability discrimination? Measures to strengthen anti-discrimination laws into a single law make, will, should make it simpler to understand that age, sex, race and disability discrimination are all unlawful. Our submission pointed out the elimination of discrimination brings economic benefits. For example, in the case of gender, independent <coughs> estimates indicate that closing the gender participation gap in employment would increase the Australian GDP by 21%. I've commissioned similar research in age and workforce participation to establish the benefits to the economy that would flow from greater participation of older people in the workforce. Um, and uh, this research will show the economic benefit to Australian economy if we were placed, say, first among OECD countries in the employment of people aged 55 to 64. At the moment, we're eighth out of 34 OECD countries. Uh, just currently, just over 60 percent of 55 to 64 year olds are in the workforce. Many more wish to be. So, because of age discrimination and other barriers that I've outlined to you, the participation rate drops off dramatically at that point. That's at the 65 point, and the loss of the national economy is huge. The extent and severity of age discrimination will, I hope, be reduced by reform measures arising from the Law Reform Commission's Age Barriers Review and from the Consolidation of Laws Project. The economic and business imperatives to remove age discriminatory practices are very strong. I'm currently engaged in national, local and sectoral discussions to promote the business case for extending our average working life and I'm hoping that this will lead to immediate and extensive changes in recruitment and employment practices. Well, in conclusion, as well as law reform, more needs to be done by government, by employers and by the community generally. To accommodate a vastly changing demographic in this country, we need to change the too old to work culture. We need to reset our sights on the real future, the future where most of us will live into our 80s and beyond and will be healthy and able for most of those years. The research shows us this is the real future. It is happening right now, but community attitudes and labour market values too often seem to be stuck back in the early 20th century where most people, far and away most people, died before they reached age pension age. We need to remove the de facto retirement markers, the policies and laws that discriminate against older workers. As a bottom line, we should all have access to rehabilitation if we're injured, we should all have access to workplace training and career advice, and we should all be able to ensure our income so that we receive weekly payments if we become sick or injured during our working lives. These are essential for the individual worker, but they are also essential for a well-functioning society and economy. Our human rights obligations require that governments must act to prevent poverty amongst older Australians. Currently, as I said, two-thirds of retirees rely on the age pension as their main source of income. For these people, poverty is never far away. Many are already afflicted with it, and homelessness among older men and women, particularly among women, is growing. The best way to avoid poverty 
is to stay and work longer. If we keep working while we're fit and able, we have more superannuation savings and can pay off the family home. And these are strong, protective factors against poverty. We must be able to make choices about how we live and work as we age, without discrimination, without the negative stereotypes of the older worker, and without the barriers that reduce our entitlements in the workplace. Our commitments as a nation to the major international human rights conventions require no less. In defeating age discrimination, we will not only advance the exercise of basic human rights of older Australians, we will also enrich our society and grow our economy. Thank you. Again, uh, um, indulged in uh, being able to ask some, uh, some questions. Um, to this um, you're welcome to take them from the left and on to okay. come to the table, whichever you want to talk about. Okay. okay. Um, first question. Paul. Again, there are radio microphones, so please do wait um, before actually asking a question. And if you could give us the name uh, and organisation um, before your question. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Paula Gerber from the Caston Centre. Um, we're obviously not alone uh, in facing this issue. I'm wondering if you could shed any light on um, best practice in other countries. Who's, who's, who's tackling this problem better than we are and what are they doing that we could perhaps uh, learn from? Well, we're not alone, but uh, I think all first world economies are facing similar challenges for the same basic demographic change reason. So when you look around the world, you don't find any other economy or any other legal system has solved all the problems we're grappling with. Um, you do find in the UK, for example, I think much more attention to specific programs. For example, they've got an extensive program, which I'm hoping to develop here somehow or other, of um, facilitating older people learning how to access the internet. Now, that's you know, not just for hobby reasons. There's so many essential services now so much essential information um, relies on your being able to access the internet. Now, um, the UK and Ireland have quite advanced programs to do that. We don't, on a national scale, have things happening here and there. That's one. Um, Finland, of course, Finland seems to be first of everything. Uh, Finland has had a policy of retraining older workers and uh, facilitating them into employment. Um, the United States isn't doing, I mean, the participation rates of older workers in the United States is about the same as here, but that's of course, in a way, there's no welfare net. And also, a lot of those older workers are working for very, very poor rates of pay. So when I, uh, and then of course, as you know, in, in the Western social democracies, they've built up, they've established very generous pension schemes. Uh, after the Second World War, France, Germany, Austria, so we won't mention Greece, we'll <laughs> but you, you notice every time there's an attempt to put a retirement age up a year or so, there's a huge outcry from the community. Whereas we are ahead in that we legislated compulsory superannuation in 1992. Now, it's not ensuring a satisfactory standard of living for all retired people at this stage, but the longer the scheme builds up, the better it will be. And we also have the safety net of the age pension, which again, while it's a real struggle for people who have no other source of income, particularly if they don't own a house, it has been increased in recent budgets and other benefits added. So I would say we're tracking okay. Uh, what I would like to do, since we are such a rich and successful economy, we're constantly told, is to get out in front. I mean, we don't have an excuse for uh, the, the bad things that are happening to older people, particularly in relation to work. Some of the other economies might. But we are the first national, uh, uh, national government to appoint an age discrimination commissioner. I'm going to New York at the end of the month because there's now kind of forums um, around the world discussing whether we should be moving towards a new UN convention on the rights of older people. Um, South Americans are very, very keen on it. Europeans are sort of saying, well, our European human rights. Uh, machinery should be enough, but we'll wait and see. Uh, we've already got an age discrimination act, although I can't say it's the strongest act you've ever seen. So I think we, um, 
we we can learn some things of some particular programs that uh, have, have proven successful. But this is a problem we need to solve ourselves, and we need to get out in front because we are a rich democracy, and we have no excuses. Most people didn't reach that age. So I think Bismarck said it at, at that time um, when all that was. Do you support um, increasing the, um, the pension age and the superannuation preservation age? Look, I don't support those um, measures at this stage. The pension age is going up to 67, as I said, and the access to superannuation age is moving up, although it's not really as high as that. It's between 55 and 60 now, depending on when you went in. I um, would not advocate uh, a mandatory uh, increase to the age pension age because it is the welfare, the safety net, and we know that even though that there are those two million people who'd like to have a job and haven't got one who are older, we know that there are some people who are not able to continue to work. At, at that age, particularly people who've done hard manual work and so forth. And I think um, we should be able to expand the possibilities for older workers to keep on working without going to, to new laws. I also think um, changing the terms on which you can access your superannuation is a bit like retrospective legislation. I mean, people go into schemes expecting that at certain ages they'll be able to draw benefits, and I'm not happy with the idea of changing that. So although those measures have been advocated, I think most recently by the Grattan Institute, um, I'm not convinced that we should go that way. I think there are more constructive ways of achieving our objective. Uh, one just uh, there, and another one. Um, Thanks, Mary Jane Meredith, coming from Justicia. Susan, one of the things that we see is still redundancy um, payments capped on the basis of age in some employer policies and in industrial agreements, um, and sometimes that's linked to the retirement age and super funds. And then on the other hand, um, as you said, there's the information that the biggest area of complaints in employment is um, being laid off or redundancy, and yeah. perhaps those people then find it difficult to get jobs. I'm just wondering if um, that issue of um, redundancy caps on the basis of age is on your agenda. Look, it, it has been, um, we, we have received complaints about that. Um, when we receive complaints, our complaints handling team go into discussions and we hope negotiations with the employer who's made those arrangements. Sometimes they'll, they're, they're willing to change, sometimes they're not. As you say, it's a it, it's one of those areas in industrial awards which really needs um, to be reviewed. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to do that, but the Law Reform Commission's review is looking very closely at uh, all the industrial awards for those sorts of effects. So out of that, we may come to a fair way of dealing with people. If there's a redundancy, really, you know, as, and some of the taxation provisions for redundancies are age discriminatory. So, don't have the solution, but we're aware of the problem and hoping for some progress. Susan, Anton Herman from Minter Ellison, just down the front here. And um, my question uh, relates to the Constitution. Um, at the moment, um, federal judges, federal court and high court, are required by the Constitution to retire at the age of 72. There's actually quite a recent uh, amendment to the Constitution, it only goes back to the 1980s. And I'm wondering whether that's now up for review. Well, it, it should be in terms of the Commonwealth, but, but it's not a law, it's a constitutional thing. I mean, we've had a few informal discussions about it. I have to say the prospect of seeking a referendum for a constitutional amendment to change that at the time when we were all trying to work out how we can get a con you know, constitutional amendment to recognise the first owners of this land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it look, it's regrettable that it was brought in at that stage. I think it might have been called the Garbawick before management, <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, I, I haven't been active on it, and I also think the judges are a very powerful group of people, and if they want to 
move on this. They could, but as you know, it's a real problem to get a, a, a referendum through. It's probably not one that the public would be very interested in or sympathetic about. Um, maybe when we achieve all the things I'm trying to, uh, I've spelled out as, as the agenda, and we have most people working into their 70s, uh, maybe then it will be, you know, it will say, well, we've got perfectly capable judges. I mean, I, I know some of them, some of them are my friends, and they will be very happily continuing to be judges, but they're not. So they go into mediation and, you know, the sort of things they do. So look, I don't think it's um, an appropriate rule for our times, but because it's in the Constitution, I haven't got it high on the agenda of things I'm trying to change. Uh, Dennis Fitzgerald, Catholic Social Services, Susan. Just on a bit about the, uh, the extending the age when the age pension age penalty kicks in. You're probably aware that Centrelink don't apply the work test in the same way for people that are 55 onwards. So there's quite a group of people, it seems to me, who are locked into Newstar, haven't got a hope of getting a job, and uh, they now have to wait longer to get the age pension. Uh, and of course, Newstar is significantly lower and has been shown not to be uh, within uh, recompense. Is that an area where there's room? Movement. Look, I hope I hope there is, Dennis. Um, it, what, a, a, as you implied, I mean, what happens if, if you lose your job and you're 52 or 53 and you can't get back into the workforce? The only thing you've got is New Start. New Start is not, and the um, uh, de work programs and forms of assistance to help people get back to work are not as relevant to older people. There are age gaps. And they also, um, so the, the job search agencies rules, I mean, they're outsourced from Centrelink, but they, they are the, the ways in which government funds are used to assist people trying to get back in the workforce. They are really designed, you could say, for the young unemployed person who has no assets. If a person loses their job in the 50s, he or she might have a house or a share in a house, so they won't pass the assets test to get that extra assistance, which means they're kind of, they're on their own. The recruiters knock them back all the time, even when it's out, outside the law. So it is a very, very dire situation. And uh, I, I hope we can get a better arrangement there. Um, you're probably aware that the Senate, just at the closure of its last session, has announced an inquiry into new start. And I'm hoping that will be an opportunity for all of us who are aware of this to, to, to make our, uh, to make submissions about how New Start needs to be, it's not just the, the quantum of dollars, it's all of the tests, as you say, the work tests and so forth around it, which, uh, well, as far as older workers are concerned, just don't provide assistance. So take the opportunity, I'm sure you're aware of it, take the opportunity of that inquiry. And please let me know if you come across age discriminatory things, because I'm learning all the time. I've been in the job a year and, you know, there's a lot happening that I haven't heard about yet. Um, but from the Human Rights Commission's position, we, we, can, we can do a lot of advocacy. So it's really good to hear what's going on. And time for one final question. Hi, Anna Brown from the Human Rights Law Centre. Uh, you mentioned the move towards a UN Convention for the Rights of Older People. I'm interested in hearing a bit more about what role you think Australia could and should play in the promotion of the adoption of such an instrument. Well, I think we, uh, Australia um, has been represented. The, the discussion's going on, I think, since 2002, when there was an international meeting in Madrid that started to consider this possibility. And um, Australia has had person attending those things, but not not at a very senior level. As far as, but but I decided that it is worthwhile going to the UN meeting at the end of August, uh, and I've been invited to speak on the basis that I am an age discrimination commissioner, and other nations don't have them. Uh, look, I, and I'm having discussions with the attorney and with uh, the foreign minister. 
And the view with the Australian government is, well, we'll see what's happening. They haven't sort of decided this is something we really want to put a lot of resources into. Um, I think I'll be better able to answer your question when I come back. Uh, uh, my own view is, I, I, of course, I'm a great supporter of international conventions. I mean, even when they're not always applied and they don't always get turned into national legislation, they are kind of a benchmark that activists and advocates can, can use to get a reform, law reform and social reform. So I can see many benefits, probably more for poorer countries than for Australia, where we do have you know, a safety net and we do have a public health system and things like that. In many countries, have no such things exist in so for other people. His families don't support them, it's nothing. So look, I think there could be a role for Australia, but as I said, uh, we're just starting down this track, and um, maybe other guys can, can come back. People who are really interested can, we can organise a meeting and see what uh, whether Australia is really going to jump into this in a in a an energetic way, or whether we'll remain an observer, an interested observer. Thank you. Uh, if you could uh, join me in thanking Dr. Martin.